This lecture starts our introduction to the nervous system. So we will begin with a basic overview of the nervous system and the histology of the cells that are involved in the nervous system. So we will go ahead and jump right into this. The nervous system is the main organ system that keeps us in homeostasis. The nervous system along with the endocrine system acting as effectors once the nervous system has detected particular ranges and then sent signals to these effectors which often are endocrine organs that will affect a change. We talked about in the very first lecture of this course about homeostasis, the body's ability to sense and respond to environmental changes to keep us in a state of balance. So it really is the first most important system is the nervous system in understanding anything that can depress the nervous system or even overexcite the nervous system could adversely affect our ability to stay in homeostasis. So um, this introduction chapter is going to be one that we will get the basics for this and then we will dig a little bit deeper as the next chapters evolve. Neurobiology is actually the study of the nervous system at behavioral and life sciences. So that is a sub discipline within this field of human anatomy and physiology. So some basic things to think about with the nervous system is that it is what is going, it is the, the it is involved in the cells that will be able to detect um, environmental changes and then respond to those sensory perceptions by sending signals to the next cells. The nervous system is the great communicator. It can communicate with other nerve cells, but it can also communicate with epithelial cells, muscle cells, um, and and we understand that it is the it is really the major system we have to think about when we're thinking about a state of health or well-being. So um, when we look at the system, we divide it into divisions, and these divisions aren't done just so we can study them in a more organized fashion. It's actually because their tissues are slightly different from one another. The two major subdivisions are the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. You would want to know that the central nervous system is composed of the brain and the spinal cord, tissues that are, are making up the brain and spinal cord, which anatomically and physiologically are slightly different from the nerves that are in the peripheral nervous system. The peripheral nervous system are going to be those nerves that are coming off of the brain and spinal cord. So there, it's composed of 12 pairs of cranial nerves that are coming from the brain and then 31 pair of spinal nerves that are coming um, from the spinal cord. The, again, these tissues in the peripheral nervous system are slightly different in, in not only their anatomy but also how they function and even how we know that they can regenerate or not. We tend to think about spinal nerves and cranial nerves if, as long as the damage is not too great, that they can sometimes regenerate if they've been injured due to pathology or due to trauma. The central nervous system is very different though. The tissues that make up the neurons in the central nervous system, the spinal cord and the brain, we have come to understand that injury to those areas, you do not get them back. Um, or it's, it's highly unlikely. So, you know, again, the anatomy is different in the, in the tissues, the actual tissues of the central nervous system, brain and spinal cord, versus the peripheral nervous system, which includes those um, nerves that are coming to and going away from the spinal cord and the brain. My light on my, oh, okay, well, that just went off, didn't it? Um, I have no idea why I did that. I'm hoping I'm still recording. May not be. Um, let's see if that is actually the case. I'm going to pause it and try to fix my light. 
Sorry for that interruption. I had a little bit of a technology issue there with the screen. Um, so this is this again. We're back into the nervous system, and we are looking at these two divisions. We'll take them obviously one at a time, and be sure that we understand the basics of these these systems. So when we think about um, the system, maybe you know, and looking at these the central nervous system with the brain and the spinal cord versus the nerves that are on the peripheral nervous system, the sensory nerves that pick up and detect um, environmental changes, and then the motor division that ends up carrying out effects of what has been interpreted by the central nervous system. We can use all kinds of schemes to help us to sort of integrate and understand how these nerves of these particular systems actually work. But I think the basic thing that um, is really intuitive and hopefully makes sense to you is that when you touch something and that this you know it's kind of elementary it takes very special types of nerves to detect sense these are called the sensory division or afferent division of the peripheral nerves uh, they will detect a signal change send and this is a cell that we're seeing here they will send that electrical impulse signal to the next cell nerve cell these are going to be the inner neurons the spinal cord that sends signals up to the brain to be integrated and interpreted so th this is going to be the great interpreter and then signals will be sent back to the motor or efferent division where a, a an effect will actually happen so if you touch something hot it takes special an entire special division of the peripheral nervous system to detect it, send a signal to the inner neurons, the central nervous system that, that actually interprets what you just felt, that will send a signal back along cells that are part of the efferent or motor division that will cause you to move away if you touch something hot or touch something sharp or whatever. So if you think about all the different uh, senses that we actually have, then you can see that that for this type of communication we've got to have highways that are uninterrupted if there are some disor disorders and diseases that affect the sensory and only the sensory there are some disorders and diseases that affect the central nervous system and you can see that even though the sensory might be working the interpretation of what's needed to affect a cha the change has been interrupted. So we would know what might be going on with that patient if they have damage to sensory versus damage to the in interpretation, the central nervous system, or interneurons. Or sometimes pathology and disease is only of the motor or efferent division. So sometimes people can be completely paralyzed but they are sensing everything. So the sensory division wasn't involved. The um, interneurons, the, the central nervous system wasn't involved, but it's the motor division that ended up being damaged. So again, the reason we want to learn normal anatomy and physiology of, of this particular division is so that we understand when there has been damage either through trauma or through disease such as pathologies what the patient is experiencing and why they're experiencing what they're experiencing and then also obviously to how to go about trying to treat um, hopefully if treatment is actually an option so at the nervous system you know we never really want to hear about anything that's that's directly affecting the nervous system especially the central nervous system but I hope it makes sense to you that we will study these divisions because um, understanding pathology would be crucial to understand the normal physiology of these divisions. When we think about a neuron, and you're seeing a neuron here, and we've been introduced to the term neuron in our histology review, we said that the nervous system is composed of neurons and glial cells that help the neurons. So when we think about the structure of a neuron, you can see one illustrated here, and then here, this one looks very different, doesn't it? And here's another neuron here. 
I think it should make sense to you that not all neurons are anatomically alike. There are many different types of structures of neurons depending on what their function is, whether they are sensory, whether they are part of the central nervous system inner neurons, or whether they are motor. There are many different types of anatomy for neuron, but a basic neuron has these similar things in common. So what I want you to know are about, are about some particular structures that are associated with neurons. A neuron is going to have a cell body. This is called the soma. The soma is sort of the, the body of the cell. You all know that cells have in, in complex um, life forms, which we are eukaryotic. We have a true nucleus. Eukaryotic means true nucleus. So the nucleus of the cell is found in the soma here of the neuron. But neurons have these um, structures that are very unique called dendrites. These dendrites here are the dendritic ends of a neuron are where the action potentials are created of when something is being sensed or detected. So again, the dendrites are going to be these areas that are sensing there, you can actually think about these little dendritic um, areas as the feelers, the ones where the action potentials get generated. So a voltage change will happen here, be sent through the soma, and then down through an, an area of a neuron called the axon. So these axons are going to be, um, this is talking, this slide talks about the dendrites, and then the axons are going to be the areas where the signal is going to be sent to the next cell. So um, millivoltage change is detected here and happens, starts here, moves through a shock, if you will, moves through the cell, through an area called an axon, and then at the end of these axons is where we're going to find the, co the connection, the synapse, the space, that will connect this, the end of this axon, to the next cell. You often hear about, and I'll see if I've got a good picture of this, you often hear about a presynaptic neuron or a postsynaptic neuron. Remember, a synapse is a space between two cells, between a neuron and the next cell. In this case, it's going to be a neuron and another neuron. So we could go back. So a neuron and another neuron, this neuron and another neuron. We looked at, when we looked at neuromuscular junctions with motor neurons, we looked at the space that's between the motor neuron and a muscle, that synaptic space, that synapse or that space. But when we're talking about presynaptic neurons versus postsynaptic neurons, it's just referring to the cell that's sending the signal at the axonal end, releasing a neurotransmitter that will actually communicate with the next cell, the postsynaptic cell. It's important that you actually really kind of understand that terminology because again, some diseases are affecting the presynaptic neuron. Some diseases are, effect, are actually happening at the synapse itself. And some diseases are going to happen because of the postsynaptic neuron is not getting the signal. So again, that's kind of terminology, but it's terminology that would be um, important for you to kind of understand, just to understand how the nervous system actually works and communicates. Again, it would be sort of um, not intuitive to think that all neurons looked alike. Many of them have very different functions. But when you look at, even if you look at a neuron that would look like this, that had a huge dendritic field, dendrites, the dendrites make up most of the cell here. This is one cell, by the way, versus ones that have very small dendritic fields or dendritic fields that are kind of all spread out. 
it would kind of make sense that they're not all anatomically the same, depending on what their function is. I'm not going to ask you to name these different types of neurons, but I think if you looked at these cells, um, they're very unique, and nerve cells, neurons, don't look like any other type of cells. They certainly don't look like blood cells. They don't look like skin epithelial cells. They don't look like anything. They're very unique. Um, neurons are, and they do have these very special structures, the soma, which is the cell body, dendrites, which are the feelers, the sensory, where action potentials are generated, and then the axons that are going to be the, the area that is sending the signal to the next cell. So um, remember, if I skip over these slides, they were just, I'm not testing you on anything that was contained in those slides. It doesn't mean that I don't think you should sort of read through them and certainly should read through the text, but it's just that I'm not going to be quizzing you or grading you on those slides. But I do want you to get everything that we discuss, including the terminology. Now, uh, the neurons. Neurons get all the glory. They get all the glory and maybe deservedly so because they are the ones that are detecting environmental changes, sensing sending signals to the postsynaptic cells, in this case neurons of the nervous system, and effecting changes which are vital and happen so very quickly. But we said in histology, our review of histology, that there's another type of cell and they're called glial cells, the helper cells. When we think about these helper cells to the neurons, they really outnumber the neurons and they're absolutely vital for the function, the, the um, healthy functioning of a neuron. So there are some glial cells that we know at, about and we know their specific function. We're learning more and more in our study of neurosciences and neurobiology. Almost every day something new comes out about discovery of the nervous system and how it's actually functioning. But we understand about a few of these and we know what, what well, we understand some things today about what their functions are. It doesn't mean we know it all. We don't. But we know some things. So what I'm going to do is actually, the net, and this is what this, mostly this chapter is involved with, I'm going to talk to you about six specific glial cells. I'm going to give you their names, and you would need to match their specific function to their name. You're going to learn four that are in the central nervous system. That means they're going to be found in the brain and spinal cord. And you're going to learn about two that are in the peripheral nervous system, which are found in those nerves that are coming off of the brain and the spinal cord. So I, um, I will go ahead and jump right into this. You, please keep in mind that these names, even though they seem like big names and um, maybe pretty foreign to you. We're going to talk about all of them. They are actually, you have text on these, but I think the illustration here is, is something because if we look at the anatomy, structure always kind of, it clues us in to what their functions are. So I'm going to do, explain to you the four uh, glial cells of the central nervous system, the four of the central nervous system from this slide. Now you can and because, because this shows you, it illustrates their anatomy and their structure, their anatomy does help you to understand what their functions are, but you would want to go back and, and also you've got these in your notes, so it will help you with your notes um, while listening to this lecture. You, get, you always have that. Now, we see in the central nervous system, which is the brain and the spinal cord, there are obviously these giant neuron cells. This is the soma of this neuron, the soma of this neuron. These look like the dendritic fields of this, this neuron, and there's the dendritic um, fingers, sensory structures of this neuron. And then these are the, the axons. This is the axon from this neuron. This is the axon from this neuron. And we can see other axons of cells that we can't see the neurons. But this illustration, we see that these neurons are typically illustrated as to what they typically look like. 
But then we see these other nucleated cells. This is another nucleated cell that doesn't look like a neuron at all. This is a nucleated cell, a nucleated cell, a nucleated cell. So these are different cells, and what these cells are are glial cells. They are helper cells to these neurons of the brain and spinal cord. They're absolutely necessary to be functioning in a healthy manner for the central nervous system to work, for these neurons to work. So we'll take them one at a time and we will learn their names and their basic functions. So let's go ahead and start. This first one I want to talk about is called an oligodendrocyte. An oligodendrocyte. If you look at this cell, it, it, the nucleus of the cell body is really making up a large part of the cell body, but it's sending extensions from its plasma membrane, its cell membrane, it's sending these extensions out and wrapping the axon of this neuron. And it's sending an ex extension here and wrapping this axon of this neighboring neuron. And it's sending another extension. So this cell is sending out these extensions and wrapping the axons here. You can see them doing that, can't you? What a lig and you can see this oligodendrocyte is doing the same. And if we were to cut the the wrapping, the wrapping, we would see that it not just went around and wrapped it once, it wrapped it many, many, many times. And if we remember from cytology, that the membrane is composed mostly of lipids, which are fats, we understand that this multiple wrapping of this axon is really kind of giving a fat uh, layering, isn't it, of these axons from the neurons. This fat, predominantly fat layering, is called myelin. It's called myelin. Myelin is being provided, this myelin layering is being provided by the oligodendrocytes. So oligodendrocytes function is to provide myelinization of the axons of the central nervous system. Many of you have heard of white matter. When you think about the brain, you've heard of gray matter and white matter. And the spinal cord as well has gray matter and white matter. When you are talking about the white matter of the brain, that is actually referring to the myelin sheathing of the axons. The axons are the highways of the neurons that are sending signals to the next postsynaptic neuronal cell. So really, when you talk about white matter, you're talking about this myelin sheathing that is predominantly lipids and fats that is actually protecting, but that's not its major function, protecting that highway system of communication from neuron to neuron, protecting that highway communication. It's vital for the functioning of this neuron. So oligodendrocytes provide myelin sheathing of the axons of neurons. The major function, and this is what I will ask you, is what, what does that provide for the myelin? It speeds the signals that are sent. You all all know that if you do touch something hot, that has to travel all the way to the central nervous system, through the spine, up the spinal cord, back down to the muscles, the motor or effector cells, and for you to move away. Does it take a long time? No, it does not take a long time to be interpreted as pain. It is microseconds. My axons that have myelin speed the signals that are sent. And it can speed a signal by a hundred times more, a hundred times greater than an axon that wasn't didn't have myelin. It's amazing how quickly our nervous system can respond to environmental change. 
think about if you were to even smell something dangerous like smoke or hear something dangerous or touch something that was painful it happens quickly and the reason it can happen quickly in the central nervous system integrating that information and interpreting the signals that were sent is because of the myelin what provides myelin the oligodendrocytes now just to give you an idea of why it's important that you know that normal um, anatomy I'll give you right now a pathology some a disorder of the myelin sheathing it's called multiple sclerosis and multiple sclerosis MS this is an autoimmune disease you all, all know what that is by this time an autoimmune disease where the immune system is attacking this myelin sheathing and then signals can't be sent as quickly they get interrupted and you know with any autoimmune disease you can go in and out of remission some people will have it pretty severely other people will have just minor kind of, it's a huge spectrum of presentation for any of these autoimmune diseases MS is but one autoimmune disease and it is when the immune system starts attacking the myelin sheathing of the axons of the central nervous system so oligodendrocytes providing myelin um, of the axons of these neurons and essentially that's what white matter is it even on a macroscopic view something you can see with the naked eye and a dissection you can actually detect that you can see the white matter and you would understand that that's really the highway um, division of this communication so oligodendrocytes so important now the next one I'll talk about are these ependymal cells if you look at the illustration here of the ependymal cells they're very closely packed together aren't they they look like they're lining um, the central nervous system neurons and they are going to be secreting a substance and that is cerebrospinal fluid so ependymal cells line the central nervous system and they secrete cerebrospinal fluid cerebrospinal fluid if you were to just look at cerebrospinal fluid it is clear it should be clear it should be colorless and it is rinsing and keeping the chemical stability of the central nervous system cells where what they how they should be so that is its function it's also it sounds like a joke almost but it's another function of CSF cerebrospinal fluid is to float your brain and that does sound like a joke but actually that water insulation is protective and it really is floating the brain if you did not have exactly the right amount then anytime you hit did anything moved funny or whatever your brain would be bumping up against the bony structure of the skull that protects it we don't want that happening so it does provide a buoyancy and a fluid layer protection of the brain you're producing about a half a liter of CSF a day and you're reabsorbing that same amount and that has to be balanced if not then you can sometimes have too little and you can have too much fluid on the brain that sometimes that's a disorder called hydrocephaly water on the brain hydrocephaly but the ependymal cells typically for the most part do exactly what they're supposed to be doing secreting cerebral spinal fluid and lining which is also offering another type of protection so two glial cells so far oligodendrocytes which provide myelinization which is speed of signals and the ependymal cells which secrete cerebrospinal fluid and line the central nervous system we have another type of glial cell we'll called the microglial cells these microglial cells are going to be ones that are derived from white blood cells they are derived from that cell line so they are protective they are protective we have our central nervous system our brain and spinal cord have multiple layers that protect they have fluid, the cerebrospinal fluid that protects. They have built-in protection, um, bony structures. They have so many structures that are built in. 
but they also have a few microglial cells that are white blood cell derived just in case something were to be penetrate. These are going to be cleaning up um, debris, but also there as a line of protection. The last glial cell of the central nervous system I want to talk about are astrocytes. Are astrocytes. And from this illustration of an astrocyte, I want you to see that this is a cell that almost looks like it's playing referee or keeping away the neuron from the blood vessel. Can you see how it looks like? It's like saying, wait a minute, I'm going to be a barrier here between this neuron and the blood vessel. And guess what its function is? Astrocytes function. They're the most abundant glial cell. They're the most abundant. Their major function is to form the blood-brain barrier. So that is actually what their function is, to form a blood-brain barrier. Now, blood, you may look at this and think, well, the, these blood capillaries are bringing nutrients to our cells. Oxygen, glucose, um, everything, all the nutrients that we need and taking, rid of, taking away waste, and that's really true. That is true. But it has an additional layer because what we know about the bloodstream, it's sterile. It should be sterile. But every now and then, there are there's what's called transient it comes and goes bacteremia you may stump your toe you may cut yourself on a farm piece of farm equipment you may i don't know uh pick at a zit I, I, you're doing something where you see blood and if you're seeing blood that means that microbes that are normal and that predominate in our environment uh, way outnumber our own human cells on our bodies those microbes can get into the bloodstream. If you can see blood coming out, then it means something could come in. It would only stay there for a short period of time. It wouldn't be like growing. That's called sepsis. But it can be there for a short period of time. And you would never want viruses, bacteria, fungi, any foreign pathogen, potential pathogen, to be able to get to the central nervous system. So you do have this added layer of protection called the blood-brain barrier. It is provided by glial cells called astrocytes. Now, that's not the only thing that the astrocytes do. They also secrete something called nerve growth factors. These are incredibly important. We're still learning even today about some of the things that they are doing. But a major thing that nerve growth factors do, and you can't see it from this illustration, but what they're doing is keeping the synapses between neurons clear. That space has to stay clear because remember, the molecules that are called neurotransmitters have to be able to move from the axonal ends of the presynaptic cell to across that space to act on the postsynaptic cell. So these synapses must stay clear, that they must stay healthy, and nerve growth factors help these synapses to stay clear and healthy so that these neurons can communicate with each other because they have to. Now, when there is not enough nerve growth factor, plaque formations can actually form in those synaptic spaces. Plaque, you know, is is um, is really like molecular and even, sometimes even cellular debris that hardens down. Sclerosis means hardening, right? Sclerosis is a hardening when they're damaged. And then one neuron would not be able to communicate with the next neuron because its space is blocked. You all know about a, dis a um, degenerative disorder called Alzheimer's where there is a deficiency of a particular of the nerve growth factors and there's a buildup of particular proteins that in these cholinergic neurons, the ones that secrete acetylcholine, so that the, the spaces between the cells are blocked. So even though you may see, which is sensory, you may see someone that you know, you know their name, you know how you know them, you know your relationship, um, the seeing them get signal gets sent to a particular part of your brain. Those those neurons send signals to the memory centers of your glial the memory neurons of your brain. But if it's blocked, if the highway is blocked, 
you can't get to the name. You can't get to your memory of how you know that person. You can't, you can see an item like a set of keys or maybe even a phone, but you wouldn't know what it was for because you can't remember um, because communication is getting blocked. That's Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's is one specific disease. There are many that lead to dementia, that can lead to dementia. Dementia is a decreased, um, a decreased facility of being able to process and think, but dementia is just an umbrella term. There are dozens of different diseases that can lead to a decline in mental uh, acuity and mental facilities. Alzheimer's is but one. And in Alzheimer's, we know it is a lack of this nerve growth factor that is leading to a protein buildup within the synaptic spaces. So again, these glial cells, you want to know their, their names to their functions so that you understand that what if there's been damage to one or there's a problem with one, what that patient might be exhibiting. So that's why we want to learn the names of these glial cells. You all also probably have heard of gliomas um, or glioblastomas. A glioma is a tumor of these of a particular type of glial cell. It's usually of one or one type of glial cell. These are brain tumors. So um, there are different kinds of brain tumors. Some of them are benign meaning they're encapsulated and they're of a particular region, but that doesn't mean that they're not dead. They can't be deadly because obviously the nervous system is our major system keeping us in a state of health and well-being. So if the brain tumor is large and, and impinging on the activity of that brain tissue, then certainly it can be life-threatening depending on where it's located, depending on whether it's benign or whether it is malignant depending on how qu quickly it grows. By this time, I think you all, all understand that cancer isn't one diagnosis. Is it? Cancer, again, is an umbrella term of which there are many, many, many different types of cancers depending on which cell line is involved. All disease is at a cellular and molecular level. All disease. So, um, I think I'm pretty sure you have a, dis a deeper insight also related to that, so you want to look at those. Now, of the peripheral nervous system, there are two more types of glial cells. Now, these are the peripheral nervous system, so those nerves that are, those sensory nerves that are coming into the brain and spinal cord, and those motor neurons that are going off of this brain and um, brain and spinal cord. So the peripheral nervous system, there are two glial cells that we want to know about. The first is Schwann cells. And for the Schwann cells, um, I want you to know that they really kind of act like the oligodendrocytes. They do a similar function, and that's that they provide myelin in the peripheral nerves, so all the axons of the peripheral nerves. So oligodendrocytes in the central nervous system provided myelin of the brain and spinal cord. The Schwann cells in the peripheral nervous system provide myelin sheathing of the peripheral nerves. So they speed signals, speed signals, absolutely vital to the healthy functioning of an individual, an organism. The other, the second type of glial cell in the peripheral nervous system, and this is all, there are six, of, there are six total four in the central nervous system, two here in the peripheral nervous system. The satellite cells, um, really a lot is now just being discovered about them, but what we understand is they're helping to regulate the chemical environment of those nerves. So keeping the chemical stability of those peripheral nerves, of the sensory and the motor neurons. So myelin, you have some more slides talking about myelin and just how important myelinization is when this myelin is forming. I need for you all to hear this part. It's beginning very early in fetal development and continuing on through infancy and into late adolescence, so even into the late teens, but so early on in fetal development and rapidly during infancy 
This is why prenatal planning, prenatal care, good prenatal diet um, is so vital to the functioning of that new neonate, the newborn. Any neonate that's born that had a deficiency that from the uh, mother is, as far as diet or what was going on will have likely lifelong consequences from those deficiencies because they will not be able to catch up. So diet is so important, the diet of the mother during pregnancy, but then also that the neonate, which is up until six weeks, newborn, toddler, it, child, children, have a good healthy diet. Breast milk, if you see breast milk sitting out at room temperature, if it's allowed to sit out at room temperature, you will see that it is more than half fat. This is not a bad thing. That's a, gr that's a good thing. And the reason that it is such a good thing is because of the myelinization. And we know myelin is predominantly made up of lipids, isn't it? The cell membranes are made up of lipids. It's why it's so important um, during development. The nervous system is going to be compromised in, in ones that have been deficient in that, especially early on. So myelin is so very important. You can see the Schwann cells of the peripheral nervous system. They look anatomically, they look a little different than the oligodendrocytes. Um, the oligodendrocytes sent out appendages and, and wrapped. The Schwann cells are actually one cell wraps and it can do it more than a hundred times. So a Schwann cell is essentially just plasma membrane wrapped over and over and over and it's really thick and it needs to be there for signals to be sent quickly. Now, um, again, this is talking about tumors of the brain, the glial cells, gliomas, and um, glioblastomas. You sometimes hear, hear them referred to as one. Um, talking about multiple sclerosis, which is disorders of that myelin sheath, and just what can happen. It is often between these ages, not only, but you know, often, sometimes there's the visions involved, tremors, numbness, speech um, defects. It can, you know, have a wide array of symptomology, signs and symptoms. In case I have not given this to you all in this class, I want to give this to you now, the difference between a sign versus a symptom of disease. A sign of disease is something that you can measure. You can see it and you can measure it. So a sign of disease may be a rash. It may be a fever. You can measure that. It may be a change in blood pressure. Um, you know, it's anything that you can see and you can document from what, what you can actually measure. Just like a sign on the highway, you can see them <laughs> and hopefully read them and pay attention to them. Symptoms are just as important though. Symptoms are things you can't see, that you cannot measure, but you should be listening to your patients. A symptom is something that your patient's telling you they're experiencing or that they have experienced, and you want to document that because those are all used together. Signs and symptoms together are used to help to get to a diagnosis. So a symptom might be something like, um, I'm experiencing headaches or I feel a little lightheaded when, you know, X, Y, and Z are happening, or I'm feeling a little nauseous, or, you know, there's just things that you can, or I feel achy, you know, or I feel whatever. So it's what the patient's telling you, but you can't really see it and you can't really measure it, but you definitely want to document it and you want to use it along with the signs that you have done in your head to toe assessments. Um, to help to help figure out what might be going on with your patient. So um, we do know that 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 multiple sclerosis is this, and I've sort of gotten off a little bit on these, but not really. So these are just these are just different slides to talk about some of the pathologies. I you do have a deeper insights insight um, related to Tay Sachs disease. This is a degenerative degenerative disorder it is a hundred percent fatal say that again a hundred percent fatal 
usually before the age of four years old. Um, it is a devastating inherited disorder. This is an inherited disorder. It is mostly of the people of this descent. Um, and what is ending up happening is the lysosomal enzymes are not working. And we remember lysosomes had digestive properties to help recycle products within the cell. So what ends up happening is that um, these lysosomal enzymes are not working. So debris starts to build up and it ends up um, destroying these cells. And again, it is a progressive disease that is devastating to the child and 100% fatal, a terrible disease. It is, and you all can see, the homozygous for Tay-Sachs allele. So um, it means that there would be a recessive disorder there. If we looked at a cross-section, a transverse section of a neuron, an axon, actually the axonal part of a neuron, if we cut, cut it, and this is actually an electron micrograph of a human neuron cut, this one is myelinated, and you can see the myelin sheathing, how thick that is, versus an axon that doesn't have it. So when we think about, again, just what myelin provides, um, I think that, I don't know, there's a slot associated with this. Oh, here it is. But a myelinated axon can speed us, can send the signal 120 meters, that's almost like yards, 120 yards a second, a second versus a half or one meter. So that's again more than a hundred times the speed if you have if you have myelinated fibers. Not all axonal fibers are supposed to be myelinated, but the ones that are supposed to be myelinated myelinated need to be myelinated. When we think about slow signals, um, you know, we think about slow, like sometimes with chronic pain, like achy pain versus, this is just one example, versus sharp pains. Sharp pains are being sent along myelinated neurons, where achy kind of chronic pains would be sent along the others. So um, regeneration, I told you that the central nervous system versus the peripheral nervous system are different in, in the actual cells and whether they can regenerate. We don't tend to think about regeneration or, or fully functioning after damage to the central nervous system. But in the peripheral nervous system, sometimes, depending on the extent of the damage, sometimes there can be regeneration. It can take up to a year. Most neurologists would tell you that within six months to one year, if you don't have it back within then, you're not going to get the function back. Um, but anyways, it can take as long as six months to a year for regeneration of a nerve fiber. And again, it would completely depend on how much damage has been done. So when we um, look at some of the pioneers and discovering these molecules that um, are, are helping with these functions, we can look at some of these. I'm not going to ask you about any of these people here. I'm not going to ask you, but I do think the history it's important to see that there have been people who have spent their entire careers, their entire um, lives in the service of discovering these particular um, molecules and what they're doing so that we can understand how they do function. And then, then from that, we can understand how to treat. So um, again, this is all I'm not going to ask you about those particular individuals because we just don't have time in this type of class but I think they're very interesting to to read about. Um, as far as action potentials go, we have already looked at the motor neuron and the muscle junction when we looked at muscle innervation. We already know a few basic things. We know that extracellular fluid, the fluid that's outside of our cells, has predominantly sodium as its positive ion, its cation. The inside of a cell, in, intracellular fluid, has predominantly potassium as the intracellular cation, positive ion. We know that there are built-in protein receptors that can respond to certain stimuli.
We saw that with the muscle. We had those protein receptors that responded to acetylcholine. And when acetylcholine came, it opened up the receptor. So that sodium could pour in, potassium would pour out, causing a shock on the membrane. We've already been introduced to action potentials from muscle innervation. Well, action potentials between two neurons are really exactly the same. Between one neuron out here and the next, this is the space between, the synapse between, and the next neuron, it's essentially the same thing. Something will open up, that something is a neurotransmitter, a molecule that will open up a protein on the postsynaptic cell and when that protein opens up, that receptor, sodium pours in, potassium pours out, causing a shock on that cell. A shock that will be sent through that cell to the axonal end on the other end of that cell to talk to the next cell. So that's all that is meant by action potentials and even resting potentials. There is a basic resting potential for all of our cells. So, um, that is the basics of what I want you to know. So if you looked at a neuron, the dendritic ends that are going to action potentials being created, meaning that sodium pouring in, potassium pouring out, causing a shock that will move down through the neuron. If there's myelin sheathing, that will actually, that will be sent so fast. It doesn't even have to be sent all the way down the axon, skipping like a rock skips across the surface of water. Um, it will skip, skip, skip. And then that shock will, will release a neurotransmitter and these axonal ends, that neurotransmitter, that molecule will move across the space and talk to the next cell. Okay. So that is essentially what action potentials are referring to. Um, and you've got a lot of slides on it, but I'm not going to ask you anything more than what I just said to you. And again, it should have sounded very familiar because you had this when you were looking at the neuromuscular junctions of the muscle um, system. Okay, speed of signal. This is talking about how quickly these signals can be sent. We discussed that if there's myelin, they will actually be sent much faster versus not. We know that a synapse is a space between two cells. In this case, it's a space between two neurons. We had looked at neuromuscular where that synapse was the space between a motor neuron and a muscle. But now we're talking about the nervous system. So these are going to be two, the space between two neurons. When we think about how many, there are so many uh, synapses. Those synapses must stay clear. They must stay healthy. We understand that, again, this is the space between one neuron and the next neuron. We understand that, that um, astrocytes play a role in that. There are others as well, but these, these molecules that get secreted from the axonal end of the presynaptic cell that have to cross this space, these molecules, these neurotransmitters, have to be able to have receptors on the postsynaptic cell that recognize them so that this cell can send its signal to the next cell and the next cell and the next cell. It has to all function in a complete pathway for this to be working. Now again, I don't ask you about any of the people involved in this, but this has taken dozens and dozens, hundreds actually, of scientists to, um, to actually understand how all of this is working. Now, what I do want you to know though are some, and I, I love these, these scans, that you actually see the structures of these synapses and they're pretty amazing, aren't they? But the illustrations are a little bit easier to teach you from. So at the end of this neuron, the presynaptic neuron, at the very end, you have this little knob of the axon, this presynaptic neuron. At the very end, it's going to have these vesicles that contain neurotransmitters that release the neurotransmitters into the space. 
this postsynaptic cell must have enough and healthy proteins embedded that receive that molecule. So these very specific protein receptors have to be here on this postsynaptic cell and there has to be enough of these respect receptors embedded so that the reaction is what it should be. So pre healthy, healthy presynaptic cell, healthy meaning that it's producing the, the neurotransmitter, uh, the molecule it needs to be. Not all neurotransmitters are equal. <laughs> We've learned one. We've learned about acetylcholine so far, haven't we? But these must be present. When an electrical signal reaches this, these vesicles will be released, releasing the neurotransmitter in the space. It will be diluted out, affecting these proteins that open up causing an action potential on this postsynaptic cell. Okay, so I hope you all hung with me on some of that. Now, as far as neurotransmitters go, we know that these are molecules. They're not cells. This is a cell, the end of a cell. This is a cell. But neurons, neurotransmitters are not cells. They're molecules that are released. There are more than a hundred different ones that we know about. And we know a lot about the functions of the ones that have been discovered. Do you think we've discovered them all? I think that would be silly for us to think that we've discovered them all. We're still discovering. We're not only still discovering new ones, but we're still discovering functions of ones that we've known about for decades. We're discovering functions that we didn't know they had. And we're just still learning about this. So anyway, the one that we have mentioned so far and looking at the, mus the muscular system, the skeletal muscles, is acetylcholine. That was a molecule that we know can innervate skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle. Acetylcholine. But there are many, many other neurotransmitters. There are a few that I'm going to want you to know now. Now, as far as their structural formula, the, how that mo the molecules of those elements come together and form a 3D structure, you do not need to know that. You don't even need to know classes. There are classes of neurotransmitters that are um, proteins. There are classes that are um, composed of other types of structures of molecules. I don't care that you know that they're structural formula. You won't have to draw them. Okay? No, unless you go into organic chemistry or biochemistry, you never would be asked this. But I do want you to know that they, their structure dictates how they function. So epinephrine is slightly different from norepinephrine. And epi and norepinephrine are slightly different from dopamine. And as far as their structure, you can see it's not a whole lot of difference in their molecular structure, but it's some. And that structure dictates their function. So dopamine doesn't have the same function as epi or norepinephrine. Serotonin doesn't have the same function as histamine and dopamine. Okay, so these are molecules and what I am going to want you to know are some of these more basic neurotransmitters, not just acetylcholine. We know that that innervates skeletal muscle, that excites skeletal muscle to contract, start that whole story of contraction that we learned about. But I want you to know a few of these others at this point now too and be able to match them to their functions. So let's do that. I'm going to take a quick break and then I'm going to come back and do that. So let's, let's jot down a few of these neurotransmitters and then be sure to be able to match their function, their specific functions to their names. Again, we started with acetylcholine back in the muscular muscular system, uh, skeletal muscular system. Acetylcholine does innervate for action potentials of the skeletal muscle uh, to cause contractions of skeletal muscle. In the brain, it actually uh, is involved in the central nervous system and sending signals between neurons of the central nervous system so that it, it's also a neurotransmitter in the central nervous system. It also is a neurotransmitter in the 
from the peripheral nervous system to send signals to the heart muscle to slow down. So here's acetylcholine, one neurotransmitter that essentially has three different distinct functions, helping with communication throughout the brain and spinal cord, causing action potentials to cause muscle contraction and skeletal muscle voluntary contractions, but slowing and inhibiting the heart muscle, slowing the heart muscle down. You would want to know those three functions in those three different areas. A transmitter um, that we think of called dopamine. Dopamine in the central nervous system is going to be a neurotransmitter, depending on where it is located in the, in the brain, is going to be one we associate with feel good. Feel good. So if you see someone that just makes you smile or you even think about something, an event or um, a person that makes you smile or happy, some people say it opens their hearts up, that was dopamine. If you uh, are enjoying a good meal and you're truly enjoying it or laugh at a joke, dopamine. Now in another area of the brain, in a very specific area of the brain, dopamine is going to act in a very different way. In one area of the brain called the substantia nigra, in this area of the brain it's going to inhibit unwanted movement, motor contractions. So see one, one neurotransmitter that has very different functions depending on where it is actually found. So we think of it for feel good or behavioral type of release and we think of it in a very specific area to prevent unwanted motor contractions. I'll go ahead and tell you right now that it is due to the lack of dopamine in this very specific area called the substantia nigra, which we'll see later on in our study of the brain, that leads to a disease called Parkinson's disease. In Parkinson's disease, some of the first signs and symptoms are contracted muscles. Uh, so contracted motor function. So it can cause a rigid sort of mask-like face contraction. It can cause the fingers to become contracted. It can change the gait of a person how they walk. Um, and it can be incredibly debilitating and it's progressive. Parkinson's disease is a progressively fatal disease even with treatment. And the problem, what is happening, is this molecule, all disease at a molecular cellular level, there is a lack of dopamine in that very select area of the brain called the substantia nigra. It doesn't mean there's not dopamine in other areas, but it's a lack of it in that particular area. Now, I want to jump down to serotonin before I do that, so this will be our next one. Serotonin has really been mis maybe misnamed, if you will, or misunderstood because of its name. Serotonin is the um, one that many people have heard of as being the problem when people have depression, clinical depression. They don't have enough serotonin. So some people associate serotonin with feel good, but that's not really true. So dopamine is our feel good. Serotonin is for functioning. <laughs> so to be able to function, you need serotonin. True, if you don't have enough serotonin or if serotonin is not being responded to by the postsynaptic cell, you may, be, you may be producing plenty of serotonin out here. But it might be that you don't have enough receptors on the postsynaptic cell. There can be a lot of different reasons that you are clinically, chemically depressed by not having enough serotonin. But it isn't really a feel good. It's for functioning. It's to make you want to get out of the bed. It's to make you want to go out and seek that next, you know, meal, which, you know, we're all animals. We have to eat and drink. Go look for water. <laughs> you know, it is actually for functioning. So serotonin, that's what it's doing in the central nervous system. Now, um, histamine, histamine 
is one that gets a bad name too. Histamine, you hear about taking antihistamines. So like you want to somehow block histamines. But histamines have very important functions. So let's look at a couple of their functions, histamine. Histamine uh, has three things I want you to know about. Histamine is going to cause blood capillaries to open up, relax, dilate. Open up, relax, dilate. So that means more blood can come to that site. That sounds like a good thing, doesn't it? Histamines are going to cause capillaries to become a little bit more leaky, if you will. That means fluid can move out of the capillary space into the tissue space. That can also be a good thing because when that happens, it means that not only is more blood coming to a particular area, but all the cells that are associated with protection and oxygen and repair and fluids of the plasma that have all the nutrients in it, they're all coming to the site too. So those are two good things. Those are things that we would want when we need them, when we need them, at the level we need them. Histamines also innervate or cause action potentials of our pain receptors. Now you might be thinking pain is not a good thing, but yes it is. Pain is a protective thing. So those neurons that get stimulated by um, reactions that we associate with pain are protective and we need to know it. when something is injured or when something is has been impaired enough that we need to give it some attention and stay off of it or be alert to it that's important excuse me so pain capillary dilation opening up fluid per the capillary perforation so that fluid can move into the tissue space um, all of those things are because of histamine and that's really a good thing. Where you have heard of histamines as being bad are in allergies. And in allergies sometimes it's just related to like the nasal area or you know might be a rash or whatever. Histamines are being released in a sort of a disproportionate amount causing some you know some discomfort in those areas and then you end up taking antihistamines. But histamines are natural and they're normal and they have functions that are appropriate. Now, epinephrine and norepinephrine, I want you to just sort of put these together, if you will. But epi and norepinephrine are going to be released in what we call our fight or flight response. Fight, stay in fight, flight, run. We can even add another F to that and that would be freeze because sometimes people freeze when they're in this fight, flight, or freeze response. But again, these are protective responses. They can help you to survive. The When these are being released in a higher amount, this is due to what is called our sympathetic nervous system innervation, sympathetic. So this entire system called the sympathetic nervous system is our fight, flight, or freeze system, and it is protective. It is for survival, and it is when you are under stress. So when you are under stress, you need your heart beating faster. So the heart rate picks up. That's gonna do, this is gonna do the opposite of acetylcholine to the heart. Acetylcholine causes you to relax, your heartbeat to slow down. These two are gonna cause it to pump faster. Not only is it gonna pump faster, it's gonna pump harder, so that means more blood being injected with each pump faster. Blood's going to be moving around. The blood vessels are going to constrict, which is going to raise the blood pressure. That means blood will really be moving fast to our big muscles so that we can fight or we can run. Hopefully we don't freeze. Sometimes freezing might not be a bad thing if you're immobile, but anyway, not a good feeling. Uh, if any of you have ever had that happen. But anyway, these are the ones that are necessary for survival in times of stress. Now, the next one I want you to, I'm not going to do all of them, but the next one I want you to know is endorphins. Endorphins and enkephalins, but endorphins, these are going to be released as our natural opiates. 
you all know that opiates are pain relievers, aren't they? Pain relievers. Well, endorphins and enkephalins, these are natural pain relievers, natural opiates that work about a thousand times better than any heroin or opium. That means that our bodies have the ability and in producing these to help us to either ignore pain or get through painful situations. Some of you have worked in medicine already know in emergency care that you will see people come in who have massive injuries. And so far they're not talking about pain. They're in shock, but they're not talking about pain. The pain will come, but they're not talking about it right then. And the reason is because of these natural opiates that they produce in, in those horrific times of stress. They will be producing them. So we produce them. There are some people who are kind of um, addicted to their own natural opiates, these endorphins. Y'all have heard of runner's high. People who do these extreme sports, um, they get a natural high from that. You've heard of hitting the, they hit the wall and then after that they could run forever. Well, the reason is because they're producing these substances and they're not really feeling the pain of it. Um, you have heard of people who have compulsive disorders that are related to self-harm, uh, cutting or food, um, you know, starvation type things. Or, or, And these are usually people who are releasing these endorphins in those times and they're just looking for that numbness. This is at a chemical level. It's actually probably surprising that we don't have more people with those types of addictions to this because we produce some very strong, um, stronger than anything we know, natural opiates in times of stress and times of pain. Some people don't. So when you um, see people that come in, I've, I've seen medical professionals who really are, are biased um, and I would say bigoted to people in saying that making comments that they have like no threshold for pain or you know look they're just seeking drugs or they're um you know they're such babies <laughs> whatever but no one should ever judge somebody because it could be that they just aren't they don't produce enough of these to help to mask some of the pain so um you will see people that have incredibly high thresholds for pain and then other people who seem to have very low or no thresholds for pain, but you don't want to judge it um, or, or whatever, because again, these are things you can't see, you don't know, right? So even though in medicine, you will hear that pain can be evaluated on that zero to 10 scale, and you'll see those scales everywhere. And you will often ask patients, how would you evaluate your pain based on the scale, um, zero to 10? that's not really a, a really valid or measurable thing. So that really isn't a sign, even though you get a number, that's a symptom, pain is a symptom. And it's definitely different between each people, each person. Substance P is actually something that's for pain. That again, pain not being a, a bad thing, pain is a good thing. When we injure something, we need to know about it. We need to feel it, we need to know about it, we need to take care of it. Because if we don't, it could end up becoming a life-threatening kind of thing. Um, so pain is not a bad thing. The only other one I think I want you to know for right now is GABA. Um, GABA stands for, and you'll see it somewhere in your notes here in a minute, but it stands for gamma, gamma amino butyric acid. This is uh, a very common one that's, that sometimes medications are targeting. Um, but GABA is actually an inhibitory neurotransmitters. So it actually in, inhibits or slows down reactions. Again, neurotransmitters can function by either exciting or inhibiting, or sometimes doing both depending on which site it is targeting. So we said acetylcholine can actually do both, right? It can excite skeletal muscle, but it can inhibit cardiac muscle to slow it down. Uh, epinephrine excites the heart and excites contraction strength and rate 
heart rate, it increases blood pressure. But epinorepinephrine in the airways relaxes the airways to open them up so that air can move in. What do you need to be able to fight or run? You need ATP. What do you need for ATP? Oxygen. So it actually, while these two are exciting in the cardiovascular system, they're relaxing in the respiratory system. Again, neurotransmitters are known for exciting, some just exciting, some inhibiting, like GABA, and some that can do both, depending on where they're targeting. So that's an, an important thing to think about too. Uh, and that's all this is this is actually referring to. Um, okay, so again, looking at this at a cellular level, the end of one cell, the presynaptic cell, the axon, the end of the axon, the space, the synapse, and then the postsynaptic cell, it's really important that you understand that this is happening at a molecular and cellular level. Um, another thing to think about is that this postsynaptic cell, these, these protein receptors that recognize this neurotransmitter, in this case it's acetylcholine, but it could have been any of the other ones I just talked about. And remember, there's more than a hundred of them. But what we know is that this postsynaptic cell for it, their, the regulation of how the response is going to be and how it's putting these receptors out there. So there's something called upregulation and downregulation to control keeping in homeostasis the response. Um, and I think I have a good picture of this in a little bit, but I'm going to talk about it in just a bit. Um, what else did I want you to see at this time? Uh, nitric oxide is a that helps to modulate responses. Where y'all have heard of nitric oxide potentially is that this and nitric oxide is produced not only in the nervous system but also the respiratory system and in other systems too. But this is the substance that's the active ingredient in Viagra or Cialis. What it does is it actually causes blood vessels to to dilate, open up, so blood can come into these blood vessels. So um, it actually is relaxing smooth muscle for erections that, so that that smooth muscle of the blood vessels relax, open up, and blood can engorge the um, sexual organs and tissues. So anyway, um, but let me see. I think I had an upregulation type of, I had a picture that really shows that well. I don't know, maybe not. But really? I was fairly certain I did, but I really might not. So, okay, but th this is an okay slide to show it to you. Um, all right, so these, these protein receptors. So when a neurotransmitter is released into the synapse and a few of the receptors pick up on that uh, neurotransmitter and this postsynaptic cell is going to start its, its process, of of action potentials what it will do is put more receptors on the membrane so that's called an upregulation as the response is happening now as the response needs to slow down these receptors will be pulled off of the membrane this membrane is constantly replacing itself so the receptors would be pulled off and the reaction starts to slow down so upregulation and then downregulation of these. A problem that happens, and it, this, this probably isn't the best slide, but a problem that happens with um, disorders like chemical depression or clinical depression, it's called, if we were thinking about this presynaptic neuron and postsynaptic neuron being the ones that are affected by serotonin, so instead of ACH right here, let's just put instead serotonin, that these are the serotonin what ends up happening is that not enough receptors may be being put up or the receptors are not recognizing the the they've changed in their structure remember proteins only act because of their structure enough that they're not responding in an upregulatory way in the way that they should the it might be that not enough serotonin is being released it might be that the serotonin is actually um, not being picked up 
uh, the second cell, the postsynaptic cell. And it might be that the serotonin is not staying around in the synapse long enough because any neurotransmitter is going to start to be broken down and then taken back up um, for the next time it, it's needed. So in clinical depression or chemical depression, the medications are targeting several different um, or they're trying to target several different locations. Some of them are inhibiting the reuptake of serotonin, meaning that serotonin, it's allowing the serotonin to stay in the synaptic space longer. Some medicines target these protein receptors on the postsynaptic cell. So depending on the medication, how it's going to be affecting, one patient may respond really well to serotonin reuptake inhibitors like Prozac and some of the others, but some patients won't respond to that. They're going to be responding more to medications that would target these um, protein receptors. So it would just depend on the individual. So again, one diagnosis doesn't mean that there's one treatment that's going to be the, the silver bullet treatment. You have to sometimes really try to figure out what's going on with that particular patient and what's going to be the best line of treatment and it can be it can take a while so it can be challenging and it can definitely take a while all right so um, let's see what else I wanted to talk to you about there's there's lots about the the action potential and um, and resting potential but the next thing I, I really want to talk to you about is going to be these different types of circuits that we are familiar with and how one neuron, this is one neuron here with several different axons talking to the next neurons, talking to the next neurons, right? So when we think about certain types of behavioral types of responses, we know that sometimes the input is very narrow on one little, one little area and there will be diverging consequences from that. So many different, from one input, there will be many different types of responses that will happen because it's diverging. Sometimes the action potentials are on a wide area and it's going to converge into a very particular spot. This is all FYI. I am not going to test you on this. I'm just showing you that they're not all the same. Some circuits are reverberating. So, you know, input comes in and then there is this short little recycling kind of activity that happens. And then sometimes um, sensory reception is going to cause these parallel circuits to actually start uh, being created. Now, the reason that, and again, and I don't, I'm not going to ask you to draw these or even talk about them ever. I just want you to know that different types of stimuli are interpreted in different ways and that's a physical cellular pathway that these are happening. An example I can give you though for this um, is that when you think about short-term memory, when somebody asks you to look at a number, you know, I think about sometimes that you get codes on your phones, right? So it's like a six-digit number that you put in and it's only going to last for 10 minutes or whatever. But you have to think about those numbers and be able to remember them for a short period of time. For that to happen, that's a cellular pathway that you create. You're creating a cellular pathway, just like a little pathway through the woods to grandma's house. You're creating a cellular physical pathway for that memory, but it's reverberating and it's short term. It's not going to last. You're probably not going to be able to remember it an hour from now. Maybe. I don't know. But anyway, short term. But this is why memorization often is not the same as learning for critical thinking. When you get in new information, you can memorize it and it's not likely you'll keep it. Or you can bring in new information and you can try to tie it to something you already know. You can take that new information and you can paraphrase it in a different way. You can revisit it later, but every time you do something like paraphrasing, relating it to something you already know, reflecting on it later, you have created multiple pathways to be able to get 
to that information. Please know that memorization is not learning for critical thinking. Looking to fill in blanks where you see something that is familiar and, you know, filling in blanks, study guides, not learning. Not learning. For learning, you have to do what I just suggested to you. Take new information in. Sometimes you write notes on it, reread it paraphrase, talk out loud, do connect it to something that, you know, sit and think about it and think about how you can connect that to something you already know. Think ahead and how it might be related to something else. Every time you do that with new information, you're creating multiple pathways to be able to get to that information. So again, you can make one little pathway through the woods to grandma's house. And then as soon as it starts to get overgrown, you don't have a path anymore. Or you can make multiple roads <laughs> and go many different ways to Grandma's house. And it's much more likely you can arrive there at that information. I hope that that makes sense to you. Um, because that is how memory, that is how knowledge is actually created through these physical cellular routes. Okay. So, um, again, talking about immediate mem memory and short-term memory um, and how it actually all is, is occurring. So there's also, um, what else I want you to know about that? Oh, declarative and procedural, you know, the retention of motor skills. So this idea that once you learn how to ride a bike, you can always ride a bike. Um, I don't use the, the example of swimming because you're actually born knowing how to swim. You were in a water environment, but you learned a fear of water, and that fear of water kept you from from. Uh, but anyway, riding a bike is a great example of that, or even typing, because you know those of us who learn keyboarding really early in our lives, um, we probably it's it's hard for us to even think about where the letters are, but we can type, right? Um, anyway, declarative long term is that you can put things into words, you can discuss them, you can communicate uh, facts and whatever. So, all right, Alzheimer's. These are some of the more recent facts about Alzheimer's. This is probably a couple of years old at this time. I want you to know that this is just one of dozens of, of disorders that can lead to dementia. So we understand that. A definitive diagnosis can be achieved at autopsy. So um, before that, now we do have some genetic markers that we can identify for early, especially early onset inherited um, Alzheimer's cases, which are so incredibly sad. They're all kind of sad, but certainly the early onset inherited type is rapid um, in its presentation and it's going to lead to an early death. But we um, we know that there's also some blood work now that can be done. There's these formations of these amyloid proteins that end up building up so we can actually, there is a blood test now that has just um, shown incredible promise in helping with the definitive diagnosis. So lots is being learned. It's being learned all the time with Alzheimer's. When you take a look at a cross section of the brain and stain it, here you would end up seeing these plaque formations that are blocking the synapses um, between neurons and the and the nervous system and this and the brain. Excuse me. Parkinson's again is a progressive terminal diagnosis. So it means that um, you know some people will have a more rapid progression than others. But it is a terminal diagnosis, and as of right now, there is no cure for Parkinson's disease. There's treatment. They end up giving a precursor molecule to dopamine called L-DOPA. Um, this is still the routine, the routine treatment. The really the there are some side effects of this, and just recently, it's been discovered that treating with L-DOPA actually probably accelerates the progression of the disease but it can give a better quality of life during the time that it's treated, it's being treated. 
right now the only um, some of the only other things you can do is for these tremors these unwanted contractions is to cut the nerve the motor neuron and then then you have paralysis so you can imagine what a terrible um, decision that would be that you would want to choose paralysis over the unwanted contractions another promising treatment there's two others that aren't listed here but another promising treatment is electrical implants that are and again this is brain surgery deep into the brain so usually the only patients who can agree to this are the ones that are completely in a wheelchair not moving at this point and there's no other recourse but they this has proven to be effective it is a very dangerous surgery but it proven to be effective in the ones that it has um, have survived the surgery. They implant electrodes in the substantia negra region of the brain and through an external monitor controlling those electrodes just on a little computer they can stimulate that area of the brain to produce dopamine and people who have been immobile in a wheelchair not being able to even feed themselves within minutes are able to get out of the wheelchair. So that's that is actually um, that is actually successfully been done. Another thing that has shown some success are stem cell replacement therapy. So that is also on the horizon for Parkinson's disease. But um, you know, a devastating kind of progressive terminal disease. That is the end of our introduction to the nervous system. So I will see you next time for the next lecture. Stay well.